pardon me, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Why, yes, yes it is. Terminal Station, now known as the Chattanooga Choo Choo Hotel, is an iconic monument to Chattanooga's historic roots in the transportation industry. First built in 1906 and displaying much of the original exterior architectural features, the station has long served as an essential pillar in the city's historic and cultural identity. While its main purpose has changed over its 114-year history, it still serves as a public place available for Chattanoogans and visitors to enjoy. Be sure to visit next time you're in town. Good evening. My name is Daryl Carter, and I am the chairman of the board of Humanities Tennessee. On behalf of the staff and board, I am so pleased to welcome you to this kickoff event for the 32nd annual and first online Southern Festival of Books, a celebration of the written word. Over the next 11 days, we will be bringing you 72 sessions featuring 128 authors from all over the country. It has been a hard year for all of us for different reasons, and there is a lot to talk about. In some of these sessions, poetry will help us articulate our anxieties. In others, we will approach the world today from the perspective of history. In many, we will laugh, and that is important too. Your children are welcome. Many sessions are intended for them and for families to enjoy together. We hope you will come away from the festival with new books to read and new ideas to share. We would like to thank our major sponsors, including the Metro National Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, the National Endowment for the Arts, Dollar Generation Literacy Foundation, and Vanderbilt University. Their support helps us to ensure that the festival remains free to everyone. For our kickoff session tonight, I am so honored to introduce Ann Patchett and Yaw Jesse. Ann Patchett is the author of seven books and has written three books of nonfiction and two children's books. She has won numerous awards, including being named a 2019 Pulitzer Prize finalist for the Dutch House. She is also the co-founder of Parnassus Books of Nashville. Parnassus is our book selling partner and your purchases of books throughout the festival from these officer, uh, excuse me, these authors support the festival. Yaw Jesse was born in Ghana and raised in Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama. She holds a BA in English from Stanford University and an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she held a Dean's Graduate Research Fellowship. She is the author of the novels Homegoing and Transcendent Kingdom, which is a New York Times bestseller and a read with Jenna Today Show pick. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all, yeah, you're gonna... Yes, thank you, Daryl. Um, thank you so much to the festival for having me. Um, I wish that we could be in person, but I'm really grateful that we're still able to meet in this way. Um, I'm also just really honored to be in conversation with Ann Patchett tonight. She's one of my favorite authors. Um, I'm gonna be reading just from the very beginning of Transcendent Kingdom, um, and, then, and then Ann and I will talk. Whenever I think of my mother, I picture a queen-sized bed with her lying in it, a practice stillness filling the room. For months on end, 
she colonized that bed like a virus. The first time when I was a child, and then again when I was a graduate student. The first time I was sent to Ghana to wait her out. While there, I was walking through Kejitia Market with my aunt when she grabbed my arm and pointed. Look, a crazy person, she said in Shui. Do you see a crazy person? I was mortified. My aunt was speaking so loudly, and the man, tall, with dust caked into his dreadlocks, was within earshot. I see, I see, I answered in a low hiss. The man continued past us, mumbling to himself as he waved his hands about in gestures that only he could understand. My aunt nodded, satisfied, and we kept walking past the hordes of people gathered in that agoraphobia-inducing market until we reached the stall where we would spend the rest of the morning attempting to sell knockoff handbags. In my three months there, we sold only four bags. Even now, I don't completely understand why my aunt singled the man out to me. Maybe she thought there were no crazy people in America that I had never seen one before. Or maybe she was thinking about my mother, about the real reason I was stuck in Ghana that summer, sweating in a stall with an aunt I hardly knew while my mother healed at home in Alabama. I was 11 and I could see that my mother wasn't sick, not in the ways that I was used to. I didn't understand what my mother needed healing from. I didn't understand, but I did. And my embarrassment at my aunt's loud gesture had as much to do with my understanding as it did with the man who had passed us by. My aunt was saying that, that is what crazy looks like. But instead, what I heard was my mother's name. What I saw was my mother's face, still as lake water, the pastor's hand resting gently on her forehead, his prayer a light hum that made the room buzz. I'm not sure I know what crazy looks like, but even today, when I hear the word, I picture a split screen, the dreadlocked man in Kejitia on one side, my mother lying in bed on the other. I think about how no one at all reacted to that man in the market, not in fear or disgust, nothing, save my aunt who wanted me to look. He was, it seemed to me, at perfect peace, even as he gesticulated wildly, even as he mumbled. But my mother, in her bed, infinitely still, was wild inside. I'll stop there. Thank you. That was beautiful. I'm so excited to see you. I met you really briefly at the National Book Critics Circle Award, and you gave such a magnificent speech that night. And you had a sparkly top on. <laughs> All the light in the world was coming down on you, and you were fabulous. So I love this book. I love this book so much. And I got the galley the first day there was a galley to be had. And everybody at Parnassus fought over it and <laughs> round. And um, and it it's funny, I, I gave the galley after it had been around to a couple of people. Um, I gave it to my sister and she was halfway through it. And then I stole it. This is so named. <laughs> I stole it back from her and I sent it to um, Tracy Ross Ellis uh, because I had heard from her and she said she was trying to get a hold of it. I was like, I have one. I can. <laughs> um, Amazing. So here it is. And it's, it's also really beautiful because one of the things it. that I realize now that I co-own a bookstore is that we judge books by their covers. 
It's a really, really good cover. Yeah. And um, the first question that I have is we picked this for our first editions club and sent you 800 plus copies of the book. How in the world did you handle that in your book? <laughs> Everybody at Parnassus wants to know. Well, I mean, first of all, it was such an honor that uh, the book was chosen for the signed first editions club. So I was really grateful to sign all of the books. It was quite the operation to do this from my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, I think, I mean, for homegoing, I went to a warehouse in Maryland and signed books for two days and then went home and never had to think about it again. Um, wow. But for this book, obviously that's not possible. And so every few days, a very kind UPS man would arrive at my apartment and he and my partner would sh sh grab these book boxes and bring them upstairs and shuttle them around for me. Um, so everybody got thank you cards and, um, and we made it happen. That's a really, really kind UPS person. Yes, he was. Uh, because it's hard enough to do when you're in a store with 10 people helping you. And, and we were all just really worried about you. And we have ideas about apartments in Brooklyn, you know, small and. Yeah. Okay, so I want to start off by asking you some corny writer questions. Uh, yeah, but what do you think, and you can give me as many answers as you want, are the things in your life that made you want to do this? And it could be a teacher or a class or a, vision that you had for yourself or anything, name it. Um, well, my first answer is LeVar Burton and Reading Rainbow um, because I was a devout, <laughs> devout viewer of Reading Rainbow. Um, and when I was seven, I've told this story a million times, so apologies if you've heard it, but when I was seven, <laughs> I heard the call for the Reading Rainbow Young Writers and Illustrators competition on the show. Um, and I asked my parents if I could enter and they said yes. Um, and I remember my dad pulled out his clunky old typewriter and we typed the story together. It was called Just Me and My Dog. And it was about a little girl who desperately wants a dog. It was um, like very thinly veiled autobiography. Um, and I sent the story in and I didn't win the competition, but I did get uh, honorable mention and LeVar Burton signed my certificate. And I think that was the first time that I felt like, oh, this thing that I really like to do might be something. Um, so that was that was one of the things. The Can other you, thing is that, oh, go ahead. You met him? I haven't met him. I would love to meet him. I'm putting that out into the world. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. He's amazing. Oh, I can only imagine. Um, he, I mean, he made such an impact on my life and I'm sure on just un, uncountable amounts of kids. Um, the other thing I would say is that I moved around a lot when I was young. Um, in my bio, you heard that I was born in Ghana and raised in Alabama, but there were many places in between that. So I lived in Ohio, Illinois, and Tennessee, um, and Jackson. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we were there for two years. Um, and then my dad got this tenure track teaching job in Alabama. And so we went there and that's where we stayed. Um, but I think because of that, because of all of the, the movement, the dislocation, I ended up being a really kind of shy and lonely child. Um, and one thing that felt really grounding to me was that no matter where we moved, one of the first things that we did would be to go to the library and get a library card. And suddenly I could feel like I belonged somewhere. Um, so I think that was the other thing that made me want to write, to kind of contribute to this world of literature that had given me so much when I was a child. Um, if you had to choose between high school, Stanford or Iowa, what of those three places do you think did the most for you as a writer? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, they all did such different things for me as a writer, but I would say high school um, because I had this amazing teacher. Her name is Janice Vaughn. She actually showed up to one of my events the other day and got put on the screen, <laughs> which was amazing. 
Um, but her name was Janice Vaughn and she taught AP literature um, and she was just an incredible teacher. I remember she was the first teacher who taught us poetry in a way that made it feel less scary to me um, and started me on my poetry reading journey. Um, she was always incredibly encouraging about my desire to be a writer. She treated me as though um, as though it were possible for me to become a writer. Um, and after her class, I think there was like a notable shift in me where it was like the, the beginning of me telling people that this was something that I wanted to do instead of treating it as a hobby in my own mind. How old were you then? I was 17. Wow. Have you taught? I did teach briefly. I taught for one semester only at Iowa. It, it is really amazing the impact you know, that teachers have. And, and especially, I'm always so interested in that question of where did you meet the teacher that really set things in motion? Because people will say to me, oh, you went to Iowa. And I think, I mean, I got to Iowa when I was 21, yeah. uh, but I was fully cooked. Yeah. By the time I got there, I, I learned some things and I met some people and had some great experiences, but, but I, wherever I was going, I was already there when I got yeah. to Iowa. And so it, it so often is the people that you find really early on. Uh, this is the other strange question. So I was born in California mm -hmm. and I moved to Tennessee just before I turned six. And I often wonder, not so much what my life would have been like, because I have an idea of what my life would have been like if I had stayed in California, but what my, what my writing life would have been like. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do you ever wonder if your family had stayed in Ghana, what your writing life would have been like? Mm, yeah, I, I wonder that all the time. I mean, I think because I moved around so much, I was really given to having these kind of thought experiments about if I had stayed in Ghana, what would my life have looked like? If I um, had stayed in Ohio, what would my life have looked like? Um, I think most notably in Ghana, I probably would have just had a harder time getting my work into the hands of as many people as I've been able to get um, to get it into the hands of. I think the other major thing that would be different is that Homegoing is a book that, my first novel is a book that's so specific to the two places that so deeply informed me, Alabama and Ghana, um, that if I had never moved to Alabama, you know, if I had never come from this country, um, that had this role in the slave trade, Ghana, and ended up in this state where uh, the effects of that trade were still so strongly felt in really kind of palpable ways to me. I don't know if I would have written Homegoing. Um, so I think that's that's another major, major change. I read somewhere once that people whose lives are disrupted when they're very young, either by big moves or if their parents get divorced or illness, um, for one thing, it sort of cements memory. And mm -hmm. so we have much earlier childhood memories and that it also it plays a big factor in creativity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then I think maybe our parents did us a huge favor by you know jerking us all over are your parents still in huntsville they are they're still in huntsville um they actually came when i did the festival i think two years ago they attended um because huntsville so close to nashville so it was the city that we would end up going to most often um just like for fun so um yeah this yeah, week we in huntsville you know to go to the space center <laughs> exactly <laughs> Right. It was always the camp. Last trip, right, for right. everybody in the South. Yep. Uh, talk about the connection between homegoing and transcendent kingdom, and and I will say they are both incredibly ambitious books, and ambition is a quality that I value in fiction so much more than really anything else. You know, it's just. Mm -hmm that desire to sort of shoot for the stars, which both of these books do in such different ways, but how do they connect in your mind? Mm. Yeah, I think from, from a craft perspective, the two books are so different um, in like a million ways. 
Um, Homegoing has 14 chapters with different main characters. It covers 250 years of history. It's in the third person. Transcendent Kingdom is, you know, it covers no more than 30 years. It's set in the present um, in the first person. At first, it was really hard even for me to see what the connections between these two books were. Um, but as I as I worked on it, I think one thing that I'm always interested in and kind of always circling in my work um, is this question of how we continue to make sense of a life, um, continue to try to live with the traumas that ne aren't necessarily ours. Um, so in, in Homegoing, that's like a kind of very macro trauma, like I'm talking about slavery and colonialism and its effects on, on these two lines of a family. Um, and in Transcendent Kingdom, it's far more intimate, like you're seeing the trauma that, um, that Gifty's mother has gone through that Gifty is then trying to process through her own life. Um, but I think that's, that's the through line, this question of how our histories, um, both large and, and small, uh, affect how we move through our day-to-day -day lives in the present. And when you were writing Homegoing, did you think, boy, when I write my next book, I really want to like do this different thing. I always feel like each one of my books inspires my next book because I mm -hmm. think, I wanted to spend more time with that, or you know, I write something with a huge time frame, and I think I want to do completely the opposite and yeah. time. And and I'm also, I'm so interested in time, and I know I know that you are so interested in time. So yeah. talk about that talk about time and and that connection. I'm so interested in time. It's true. I think. In Homegoing, I actually, so Homegoing, for those who don't know, it has a structure where um, it almost, it's, it's almost like a fishtail braid. Like it starts with one sister, then the other sister, and then it alternates descendants down the line. Um, and that structure didn't come until later in the process. In the beginning, I was, I had a novel that was much more conventionally structured. It started in the present, and then it just flashed back to 18th century Ghana. Um, but the thing that made me change it was that I started to realize that I really wanted people to be able to feel the passage of time, to be able to understand the way that this thing became that thing, which became that thing, and so on and so on. And I felt like you lost that element of time um, when, uh, when the book was just set in the present and thinking about the past. Um, in Transcendent Kingdom, there, the time element, I think, has more to do with the kind of flashes back and, and forth. This book is um, nonlinear, and the present storyline is actually quite simple. It's about a woman whose mother has come to stay with her, and she's taking care of her mother while working toward her thesis. Um, but I think what keeps the what keeps the story moving, the propulsive element, is that we get to see her processing her past, processing her childhood as she's doing this work in the present. And so it flashes back and forth in time in a way that I think makes makes it clear um, that we are carrying our childhoods with us um, throughout our throughout our adult lives. That's so interesting. And and something that I feel like with epigenetics, you know, there's just more and more study, you know, how we carry it throughout generations and then how we carry it on in our own life. Were you scared about writing a second novel? Were you afraid of the second novel crash, which you so clearly <laughs> have not experienced? I was, you know, I was really, I felt really, Honestly, I felt kind of bereft after I finished Homegoing. Like I just was like, what am I supposed I to do now? Yeah, it took me so many years and um, it really did feel like a novel that I had been working toward my entire life. And then I just kind of felt like, okay, what now? Um, and it took me a while to both find this, carve out the space to allow myself to work on something new, um, but also to wrap my head around the fact that I had something new to offer at all. Um, and I think writing something so completely different um, allowed me to kind of relax that, relax that desire to compare the two novels, even for myself, 
which I think made the process a lot freer for the second novel. But it was it was scary. Um, I didn't, you know, I was lucky, like nobody was really pressuring me. Um, I have like a great team that was like, take as long as you need. Um, and I felt like they meant it. Um, so I didn't feel any kind of external pressure, but um, I think, you know, that ambition that made me want to write that first book didn't just disappear. Like I wanted to keep writing. I just didn't know what I had to give. Did you have a two book deal? Did you owe them a book? I didn't, no, I didn't owe them a book. Yeah, I, I always think that would be the most unbelievably nerve wracking thing. So when you say they were really nice, of course they had to be really nice because <laughs> under contract to, to give them a book. Sometimes they're not, you know, as nice yeah. when you hold them that book and they're right. tapping their fingers and waiting for it. Um, I have to say there was an element of, I mean, obviously, Homegoing is, is a heartbreaking book in, in a million ways, but as a reader, every chapter, I got fully invested with the people in that chapter. And then I would turn the page and think, mother of God. <laughs> and and it, um, it really was a book that on that, in that way, just broke my heart over and over again, because I wanted to stay with them. And I kept thinking, it, it must have taken so much discipline to not write a 3000 page book because it just could have gone on forever. I mean, that book could have been your life's work. You could have just written it on and on and on. And how did you have the discipline to rein it in? Mm. Well, I think one that I'm kind of concise by nature. Um, so Generally, when I'm getting feedback from other people, it's about how I need to make things longer, how I need to expand sections. Um, so there's that kind of natural tendency toward towards brevity. Um, but I think the other thing too was that because of how much time I wanted to cover in, in that novel, I felt like I had to be kind of cutthroat about how much time I allowed the characters to have on the page because I wanted readers to feel that full sweep of the history. And I and I think you're right, like this novel could have easily been thousands of pages, um, but I never wanted you to forget those first two characters, to have to like rack your brain to remember what happened at the beginning of the novel. Um, I felt like it was really important that you could hold the entire sweep of this history in your hands so that you could recognize that, you know, a hundred years is really but a breath. Um, and, and I felt like that that aspect of things would be lost if it was many thousands of pages. And and it was one of the reasons, I, I can't tell you I, um, how much I love this book. Um, it, is, it is one of my two very favorite books of the year. Oh. You know what the other one is? I do want to know what the other one is. Louise Erdrich, The Night Watchman. Um. Okay. Just, it, I thought, oh, nothing's going to top the Night Watchman for me, and this is just sitting right next to it. Oh, what a what an honor! Oh, but I was really excited. I was really glad to see that. Okay, you have a small number of characters, and 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 a finite amount of time, and that I was going to be able to go on this deep dive and stay with them. All right, let's talk about science. So, years ago. I met Richard Powers and he said, um, I wish more people wrote books about science. It's really important to write fiction about science. And because I adore Richard Powers, I thought, okay, I'll write a book about science. And, <laughs> um, and I did. And as soon as I, I started writing fiction about science, I, I realized what he meant. And there is so little of it out there. Um, and you do such a good job with the science. Did you read Nell Freudenberger's book, Lost and Wanted? No, I didn't, but I heard about it. I actually put off reading it because I was in the middle of writing Transcendent Kingdom. Um, and so I was like, oh, this is one to, to remember for after, but I still haven't gotten to it. I think that you'll feel a great solidarity with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's There's nothing at all that's similar, except it's a, it is another very, very smart woman taking on 
hard science. So mm. tell us about how you got to the science. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, first, I should also mention that I met Richard Powers at an event, um, I think in 2018. And he's like another writer that I really admire. And I had read the over story and was blown away. Um, and it just really did remind me of the power of fiction that explores something um, that we don't often see written about. Um, so he's great. Or if, it in nonfiction, but exactly. not, not in fiction. And is he not the nicest man in the whole world? The kindest man, the kindest, kindest man. I could have listened to him talk for a million years. Yeah. Um, so that's an aside, read the overstory if you haven't. Um, but for the science in this book, I, I had just this wonderful experience of having my best friend from Alabama. Um, she is herself a neuroscientist. Um, and around the time that I finished homegoing, she was finishing up her final thesis project in her doctorate program um, at Stanford. And um, she had a major paper that was due to be published. And I remember asking her to send it to me because I wanted to support her as she had so lovingly supported me. And I sat down to read this paper and I could not, I could not penetrate it. Like I could not understand what was happening at all. Um, and I thought this is kind of strange. I'm a smart woman. I know this woman very deeply, very intimately, and I don't have the language with which to relate to her on this level. So I just asked if I could go shadow her in her lab um, and at that point, I didn't know that I wanted to write anything. I just want, I was just curious. Um, and I went and the first day that I went, she was performing a surgery on her mice that I detail in the early pages of this book. Um, and she was explaining all of the steps to me and why she did it. And she had always explained her work to me as being about addiction and depression. Um, but I hadn't really seen it on this granular level. I hadn't seen the technical aspects of it. And I found it so fascinating, but I also found it fascinating just to, um, just to see somebody that I, that I really loved and admired in a completely different context. Like it got the wheels turning for me. Um, and I thought maybe this is something that I could write about. Um, and it almost felt like a writer's prompt of a novel, like write a book about a woman who researches addiction and depression. Um, and it built out from there, but it was, um, it, the research was really, really fun to do, honestly, because it was something that I knew nothing about. I hadn't taken a science class at all since college. Um, and I had forgotten, you know, how, how thrilling it can be to learn something totally new to you, um, especially when you're trying to make fiction out of it. I just found it so uh, so pleasurable, despite you know how heavy this book can be at times. I found it to be a real pleasure. It is the best part of the job yeah. to say, "Oh, I'm you know I'm just going to stop and learn everything I can about something that I don't know anything about, and then try mm -hmm. to make it clear enough." to put it into fiction and make a story out of it. That's, it's just the greatest gift. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so writing about addiction and, and having a character who's at Stanford and you were at Stanford, one of the things I was really curious about is you, you put in pieces of your own, it's not even your own life, but it's sort of like your own set of facts. She's from Huntsville. She was born in Ghana. She's at Stanford. And this is not an autobiographical novel. And, mm -hmm. and I'm really, just as a writer, I'm really interested in that because I would think I would not want to go down that rabbit hole of having people say, well, you know, <laughs> the character is from Huntsville and Ghana. So it must be that she did this. And, you know, yeah. Why? Why do that to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it didn't really even, it didn't feel strange to me while I was doing it. I think I had a moment of panic after I sold the novel where I thought, oh, everyone's going to think this is me. Everybody's um, think that your mother is, you know, catatonically depressed and in bed. Exactly. I did, you know, I had to have that conversation with my, with my mother. Even after I read the, I read a, 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 the first chapter of this at a fellowship that I was doing um, in Berlin. 
And a woman in the audience asked the question about autobiography. I, you know, gave my spiel. Um, and even after saying that, somebody came up to me and was just asking me questions about my life. And I, I mentioned my brothers. And she was like, are your brothers still alive? And I thought, oh, it didn't sink in that this isn't, <laughs> that this isn't about me. Um, so I, I, I knew that it was going to happen. Um, but also, I really, again, like I'm really invested in thinking about place and the way that place informs people. Um, and I hadn't written about Huntsville um, extensively before this. Um, and Huntsville so important to me. And I hadn't seen Huntsville in fiction before. Um, and so that was part of it. I just wanted to be able to set something in my town to see um, Alabama as I knew it in fiction. Um, that, that, felt, that felt important. Um, there is a moment in the lab with the mice and, and I should just uh, back up and, and say in, in a way that is as least sentimental as possible that my best friend um, became addicted to Oxycontin and then heroin and died of a heroin overdose when we were 39. And uh, she had been in the hospital. She'd had jaw cancer. She'd been in the hospital a lot as a child. And she was she was always sneaking out of her room in the hospital to go and play with the mice. Like nothing was locked. She would go down. So all of these things yeah. uh, really came together in such a powerful way for me. And the moment when Gifty by the way, the best named character in this situation, <laughs> drinks the insure was so meaningful to me um, because of the heroin. And, and I remember, you know, Lucy kind of saying, don't knock it till you tried it. Mm -hmm. and, and the mice, I felt like the mice were saying, don't knock it till you tried it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what I mean, that's so it's such a small and specific thing. But were you thinking about the heroine when she when she drinks the insure? I was, I was, and I think she was too. You know, all of these years circling her brother's addiction, um, avoiding her brother's addiction, um, avoiding talking about her brother's addiction, and now here she is doing this work that is bringing her face to face with addiction. Um, and obviously, it's not the same as what her brother went through. Um, but I think it's the first time in her in her life in her career that she has this place from which to relate to him. Um, and she has like colleagues who might understand what she what she was going through. Um, and so when she's drinking that and sure, I think it is um, it is definitely a point where she's thinking about her brother and the heroine. We we talk for a minute um, about the whole Oxycontin thing, which um, really drives me crazy when I hear about it in the news because everybody seems so willing to have this level of sympathy for Oxycontin because it is, uh, it is the scourge of uh, poor white people and um, sort of fills me with weird rage. Uh, and I was just wondering if you would talk about that. Yeah. Um, it also fills me with rage. You know, I, like so many of you, I was reading all of the reports that were coming out a few years ago about the opioid epidemic. Not that the reports aren't coming out, um, but just that, uh, you know, now that we're in the pandemic, I feel like the, the uh, amount of media attention on the epidemic that is continuing to run parallel to this pandemic has kind of slowed, though the deaths are increasing. Um, but anyways, I was reading all of of these um, essays and just articles and watching documentaries. And I was really moved by the fact that there seemed to now be a willingness to interrogate the role of pharmaceutical companies in creating this problem, a willingness to understand it as a healthcare issue. Um, a lot of just sensitive, nuanced, humanizing work was being done, but um, clearly being done because the people who were most affected were white. Um, and uh, it felt like this shift from talking about addiction, um, opioid use disorder as a criminal issue to talking about it as a healthcare issue 
went hand in hand with, um, uh, with the race aspect of things. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, you know, the heroin epidemic is longstanding. Um, you know, you, we can trace it back to the 60s in cities um, with Black people. Um, and, and the fact that Black people in cities who have been suffering from heroin use disorder for all of these years um, have been left behind in this conversation um, was really heartbreaking to me. And so I wanted to have a novel that talked about these issues, um, but that centered a Black family and offered them the same kind of sensitive, nuanced, humanizing um, attention um, as the attention that was being paid in the news around uh, the white rural suburban uh, opioid use disorder sufferers. Yeah, and that and that Nana starts his his pathway to addiction through an injury, you know, through yeah. through an illness, and yeah. and there many do. Yeah, the mouse who just keeps stepping on the little platform. Um, the hardest question that, or I wasn't, I don't know, hardest or weirdest or whatever question that somebody asked me once when I was giving a talk. Woman stood up and said, um, "Do you write your books in order to praise God?" And oh. and I was like. <laughs> And I said, so, so you're asking me if I believe in God. And she said, oh, yeah, I guess I guess that was. But this book is so beautifully about faith and church and God, which are th three things I put in three separate boxes in my mm -hmm. own life. Um, you have anything to say about any of those three things? <laughs> Faith or church or, God or how you're doing with it. You don't have to answer all three. You could just pick one. <laughs> sure. Do I have anything to say about it? You know, I grew up similarly to Gifty. I was raised in the church. I was raised Pentecostal. Um, and it was a big part of my life. Um, and I think as so many people in the South have experienced, like there was very little separation of church and state and how we went about our days. Like people wore their religion, wore their faiths on their sleeves um, in a way that I that I don't see anywhere else that I've lived. I didn't see in California or even Iowa, um, certainly not in New York. Um, it, was always, it always felt natural to me to be able to weave the, that aspect of, of one's life into other parts of your life to braid those things together. Um, and I think, you know, once I got to college and there was this assumption, it felt like often that there was this assumption that to talk about one's spirituality, to talk about one's faith meant that you were somehow like intellectually inferior to the other people in your in your class. Um, that, that infuriated me and it had also never occurred to me because that wasn't the way that I was raised. Um, and so I think this is a book about a woman who is experiencing that kind of dilemma within her own life even though she has turned away from the faith of her childhood, um, she still kind of honors the, the child that she was, who was devout, who was pious. And more importantly, it's the way that she shows her love to her mother. Um, so she can't cast it off entirely because to do so would be a kind of betrayal to her mother. Um, and so she holds space for this faith, um, even, as she, even as she turns to science. Um, and I wanted it to feel like those two things didn't necessarily have to be in opposition, um, that they didn't have to be these binary options. Um, Gifty is, I think, at the end of the novel, she comes to this place of just um, just kind of acceptance and, and understanding. You know, I think also that if you're writing about people who are imprinted by the traumas of their childhood and of their life and, and of the generations that came before them. We're also imprinted by the good things that happen and, mm -hmm. and by our faith. So, so even if we come to a crossroads with it later, it's still in us. Yeah. I went to school for 12 years, mm -hmm. you know, and, and um, it's always there and it, and really in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We are we are out of time. I want to say, I love this book. I love this book. Every single thing about this book, and we still have about twelve signed copies left at Parnassus. Parnassus, 
the official bookseller of the Southern Festival. <laughs> So go and and go online, order this book from us, and if you are first, you'll get a signed one because we have just a few left. And be sure to support the Southern Festival of Books because this is a massive undertaking and they would really appreciate it. And yeah, I look forward to the world in which you and I are in the same room together. And I just wish you so much. Um, good health and time to write and love and safety and all the light in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. This was such a pleasure. It really was.